Good afternoon, friends. Uh, welcome to this uh, particular session, uh, which is sponsored by Hoya. Uh, we are going to talk about something new, a uh, Bivinix Geometric. Uh, uh, I'd like to invite uh, the chairpersons of this uh, important uh, meeting, Professor Namrata Sharma. He is already here. Dr. Suha Sandipurkar, Dr. D. Ramamurthy, Dr. Gaurav Lothra to chair the session. And we have our renowned speakers. We're going to talk uh, on various aspects of uh, the Hoya lenses. We have Dr. Anurag, Dr. Sonu Goyal, Dr. Vavikar, Dr. Mahipal Sajdev, and Dr. Anaga Haru. I will request Dr. Namarta to his, uh, say something on this uh, session and so that we can start the session on time. So the session is about introducing uh, the new preloaded trifocal uh, intraocular lenses. And uh, I think uh, the first talk is going to be on the right patient selection for PCI wells criteria and need by Dr. Anurag Mishra. We are going to be hearing about a new intraocular lens which has come, which is the Vivinex uh, geometric uh, intraocular lens. Uh, so, over to you, Anurag, for your talk. Asha, Anurag, there are you know, three uh, questions to be you know, answered in your talk. Mm -hmm. As per the you know, uh, information here, what are the right patients at the surgical pulse? What are the preoperative exclusion criteria for uh, PCIOL patient selection, biometry, diagnostics, pulse in selecting the PCI -OLs? So, Dr. Anurag is one of the uh, one of the superb orators and a good teacher, and uh, definitely you're going to learn so many things today. Dr. Anurag, please start. Thank you so much, sir. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, greetings and regards from the land of Lord Jagannath. So, we'll start straight away with the patient selection, and of course, the patient selection will not be proper if you do not have the right kind of gadgets to look the patients through and diagnose these various issues that actually make them unsuitable. It's very easy to find the patient suitable. It's more difficult to find the patient unsuitable, particularly when you're talking about ATLs like the trifocals. Let's, so let's start with refraction, the basic refraction that we see in the OPD. Um, we have to see whether the patient is myopic or hypermetropic previously, and there's a pre-existing astigmatism or not, based on which we see whether the patient is qualifying for a non-toric or a toric platform. Previous glasses and refraction reports, if any, we have to keep in mind that the total refraction the patient is using in the form of glasses could be a combination of corneal astigmatism and lenticular astigmatism, so that must be kept in mind. Anisometropia and chances of amblyopia have to be kept in mind, and they can be ruled out with a simple test of RAM, and it's a very inexpensive equipment. We can, we can all keep it in our OPD to see what is the retinal acuity that we are likely to retrieve after the uh, surgery. So this is just one uh, interesting example that I wanted to show everybody. The autoref readings, as you can see, show plus 4.25 and minus 4.25. This might show that the patient has refraction, patient needs glasses. However, this is also likely to come after a trifocal implant where the patient actually does not need any glasses. It's because of this diffractive rings, the AR shows bizarre readings like this at times. But when it comes to the acceptance front of the patient, the patient does not accept anything. So there's no reason to jump off the moment you see that on the AR readings. Right, so let's come to the image guidance because that is something that uh, gives us a, a very good feedback into it. Now we have the advent of another machine called Argos which combines image guidance with biometry and there are two USPs of that machine which we would like to talk to you about. Normal biometry machines take one refractive index as the reference refractive index of 1.3375 when they measure the, measure the actual length. But what we have to remember is the light travels through different tissues at different speeds based on the refractive indices. This machine identifies that, splits the refractive indices into cornea, aqueous, lens, and vitreous, and calculates the actual length according to the light that travels through the tissues in different speeds or varying speeds. The other USP it has is in very dense cataracts, it has an ERV mode, an extended retinal visualization mode. In the normal mode, the actual length that calculates is from the corneal vortex to the posterior capsule. 
In the ERB mode, it calculates the distance between the posterior capsule and the center of the fovea, and then it stitches them together to give us the complete axial length. So it has the propensity to calculate the axial length even in the densest of cataracts. And then you can cross-check whether the lines align or you have to retake them. So this is one uh, uh, feedback. This is the image guidance system. The yellow line always comes in when the uh, residual astigmatism is more. It is shaded green when the astigmatism is acceptable. It also gives you to the toric model, whether T3 or T4, and it also adjusts according to the SIA that you feed in. Even if you don't calculate your SIA, you can just put in the incision size, whether it's 2.2 or a 2.8, then the machine calculates the toricity uh, values for you. The maximum number of inputs that come in towards an ATL practice perhaps comes from the eye trace, the aberrometry that we have in the industry. And what does it show us? This patient, for example, wanted a trifocal, but we could not give it to him. As you can see, the angle alpha is very high, staged at points 0 0.605, so no IOL is there in the market, which has a central bullseye of more than 1.2, 1.2 .2 being the maximum. So this patient perhaps is unsuitable for a trifocal implant, so it's shaded red. The other thing the patient, uh, the, uh, the uh, machine gives us is the second and third error aberrations. If the coma and the trefoil from the cornea are high, the image is already distorted. So you don't want to distort the image further and reduce the contrast sensitivity post-operatively by putting in a trifocal. So these patients are also unsuitable for trifocals. The next example we see is that the spherical aberration from the cornea is very low. It's staged at 0 0.125, and the total spherical aberration coming out of the eye is 0 0.026. So you have to carefully choose the IOL that you're going to fit in. In my opinion, this patient should be given actually a spherical IOL, not even an aspheric IOL, which reduces the positive spherical aberration. Because if I have a, an example of a patient, uh, <clears throat> this patient had a spherical aberration of minus 0. Point. This is a post-operative scenario. Spherical aberration of minus 0 0.410. We never knew why the patient is dissatisfied. The patient came back to me repeated number of times and said that I'm, my image is not crisp, it is not clear. Unless we put him to this uh, uh, test by eye trace, we found out that the spherical aberration was low. And when we plotted the DLI, we saw that the image is not very clear. This is the corneal image which is coming, which is pretty really sharp. But from the internal side, since the spherical aberration output was on the negative side, there was some sort of uh, image distortion coming as an output. This is another example wherein the internal higher order aberrations are very distorted. The cornea is doing fine, but the internal distortion is too much there. And when that happens, then you suspect a lens tilt or a dislocated or subluxated lens. Although it is not clinically evident to you, the machine shows that this is a lens tilt and perhaps not very uh, ideal. This is a perfect example. The angle alpha with the normal limits, these sort of distortions happen in normal cataracts as well if the cataract is very dense. And the delta is also doing pretty fine, so perhaps this patient qualifies for a toric implant, but a toric trifocal can be given uh, in this. But the other interesting thing in this particular patient is, if you look at the refraction, they take it, it takes it from different zones. So as you go down from 3 millimeters to 2 millimeters, look at the astigmatism that drops from 2 millimeters to 3 millimeters from a value of minus 5.47 to 2.24. So this is a classic example of anterior lenticonus, wherein the central part shows you the maximum amount of astigmatism. When the scan size goes wider, the astigmatism comes down because it's a cone right at the center. This is a good MTF curve. This is another thing that the machine shows you, the modular transformation cur transfer curve coming out of the retina. This is a critical curve that is there, the critical square that is there down below. If the line is above that, then you know that the contrast sensitivity coming in from the cornea is good. And this patient qualifies for a higher order IOL, uh, for an ATIL practice. But if the MTF falls below that line and shades somewhere in this square, then this patient does not qualify because the, the contrast sensitivity is already reduced from the cornea. You don't want to reduce it further by putting in an ATIL. So this is an unsuitable MTF curve. Some of the times you, when, you, when you subject the patients to specular microscopy, you see that the hexagonal cells, cells stand at zero and they have very distorted images. So they are also, in my opinion, not suitable for ATL practice. So you better avoid these patients because they are going to have post-operative uh, indices which are uh, low too. The most important feature apart from a proper biometry perhaps is the pupil size. And for me, there is a cutoff of 3.5. The pupil size should not be more than 3.5 in a scotopic and less than 3.5 in a photopic condition because when that happens, then there is a lot of image distortion. So the pupil size has to be kept in mind. This particular example, the pupil size is 2.8 in low mesopic pupil. So you, it, it is not qualifying. 
And in the other patient example that we see, I mean, you can, you can of course, uh, uh, measure the pupil with different instruments if you have access to them. The other example is this. This measures 3.95 in, uh, uh, in a photopic condition, also unsuitable for uh, ATIL practice. Also, the pupil size can come from the anterior on coming in from Heidelberg. This is a refraction map and the amplitude of accommodation. As you can see, this is testing the right eye and the the refraction values in the, on the center is minus 2.25. This is when the patient is accommodating. This is where the patient is not accommodating, not inducing any myopia, but the refraction map is pretty stable. Very ideal candidates to uh, receive an ATIL, particularly in trifocals, whereas in this, there is some amount of image distortion that is happening the moment the patient is trying to accommodate. This is a post-operative scenario. And this is very unsuitable as a refraction map because this is, there is a distortion when the patient is trying to accommodate. Even without the accommodation, also the patient is uh, having some sort of distortion as the refraction map. Now coming to the trifocal in question, as uh, uh, Professor Titi also elaborately discussed in the beginning, this is a uh, nail called Geometric uh, that comes from the house of uh, Hoya surgical uh, devices. Uh, this is one example wherein uh, uh, both eyes have reduced, uh, both eyes have already received trifocals. Look at the effective range of accommodation that is happening, effective range of focus that is happening there. It's 2.44D. There's no reason that this patient should be dissatisfied. He has very good distant vision. He has very good intermediate vision. He has very good near vision as well because the range of focus ranges to 2.5, almost normal. Bilaterally, he has received another trifocal aisle, which is not from Hoya. But the patient is very happy. I have no complaints against the patient, does not complain of anything. But this is another example where one eye has already received geometric, that's the eye shaded in pink, the left eye. The right eye is about to receive it, the right eye is unoperated. The difference between the previous DOF curve and this DOF curve which has received geometric is the depth of the effective range of focus as you can see is still 2.35, that is pretty, doing pretty well. But in the previous curve, the highest peak of the curve was lying somewhere at 0 0.5, 0 0.6 range of log mark. In this, the peak is very sharp and it goes right next to one, which is excellent visual quality. So this is what I have found in my practice, the geometric, whatever implantation I have done, all the depth of focus curves behave this way. The peak is very sharp, the quality of vision is excellent. They do not encounter any halos or glare in the practice. So this is the DLI of the same patient coming in from the left eye. You can look at the image that happens, that comes out of the cornea, from the internal and the total output, very crisp and clear vision. This is another trifocal. The patient was not complaining anything, but if you subject, just for the sake of comparison, if you subject them to the DLI index of the eye trace, there is a distortion that is coming in. However, I re-emphasize re the fact that the patient was not complaining anything, but you do see a, a distortion and you can clearly demarcate the difference between the two IOLs. The anterior uh, gives us a lot of things, uh, including the topography and the total corneal power in post-refractive cases and an idea into the lens tilt where the axis do not match the axis of the eye and the axis of the lens. Uh, it gives us the excellent industry-leading ASOCT pictures from which you can know what type of cataract this is, posterior polar, communicating, non-communicating, and hypermature liquid-filled pockets, all that. Specular microscopy gives us a true picture of the specular cell count, and as, as we discussed minutes back, if the hexagonal cell percentage is too low within low endothelial cell count, we should be staying away from at least planning a trifocal in those patients. Then uh, the ocular surface has to be evaluated. If you have access to a dry eye suite, fantastic. This patient, for example, had a very low uh, lipid layer content uh, standing at 57 and 55 preoperatively. We sent the, the patient had come ready for surgery, but we, we sent the patient back with uh, uh, treatment with uh, antibiotics, worm compress, and ointments. After three weeks, the patient came back, the lipid layer was doing pretty well, uh, ranging up to 100%, and then we repeated the biometry and uh, took the patient off for surgery. What happens in a biometry is that the keratometric uh, myas do not come properly, so it actually distorts, particularly if you're planning a toric implant in that patient, it distorts the delta value in the repetitive examination. So it's important for us to go back to the biometry sheet, the printout, and cross-check whether all the myas came properly or not, sharp or not, uh, so that we don't miss out on the uh, stigmatism, total astigmatism that is to be corrected. Uh, so in a nutshell, that's all I had to share with all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anurag. I think uh, you highlighted all the important points. And uh, in terms of, uh, like, you know, you talked about so much of aberrations and uh, the assessment by eye trace. You know, many people may not have access to eye trace per se, 
for a general people, what should be the guideline uh, to you know have a proper uh, selection is all right uh, for a, uh, getting you know not uh, putting them into a premium IOL. Suppose so, they don't have eye trace source. So the angle alpha is something that uh, many machines calculate nowadays. Angle alpha, not angle alpha exactly, but chord mu is something that many machines calculate. Even if they don't calculate it, they'll give you cross marks and you can uh, you can have a rough estimate from there. Uh, where is the chord mu going and uh, how likely is it to uh, have an off-axis placement? The idea is the center of the pupil has to be at the center of the bullseye that, that, that the trifocal has. Apart from that, the dry eye is something uh, we can easily exclude in the OPD by various techniques, various simple measures. The aberration profile is, of course, something that has to be looked at with an aberrometer only. If you don't have access to it and you're planning the uh, trifocals, in particular, and in my opinion, uh, I think uh, one should get in touch with the center which has access to the machine and uh, maybe you know evaluate the patient properly before planning so. Uh, but these are the basic things which can one can do at the office uh, even uh, even without having access to such high-end equipment. Okay, thank you, Anurag. Uh, uh, Dr. Bhavika would like to add something on a pre-selection uh, ways. I think profile of the patient is also to be taken oh. into account. Oh. Dr. Mayipat, sir. So I think uh, what he has highlighted is preoperative uh, ocular surface is something which is important. Biometry being bang on uh, is something important and obviously uh, psychology which he has talked about and where would the IUL center is also something important. But I think with the present generation of trifocal lenses, the incidence of adaptability <coughs> uh, and neuroadaptation has gone up very significantly. Uh, the complaints have gone down and uh, whatever technology they have used to smoothen out the ridges that are there, I think that has helped significantly. Uh, and uh, I think somebody will be talking about uh, two different types of uh, lenses that they are getting, which is the geometric, which you can have <coughs> different light distribution between intermediate and near. So yeah, I, think, oh, I think Anurag did cover all the yeah. aspects, like, you know, right from the ocular surface to, you know, specular microscopy, <coughs> then looking for a, the aberrative profile of the uh, internal aberration versus coronal aberrations, looking onto the thing. The other thing nowadays for a cataract surgery per se, it has become very, very important to assess the posterior segment also. Maybe a OCT of a macula should be assessed. Sometimes, you know, you do have some sort of a uh, epidermal membrane or some traction, something, especially people suffering from other uh, diabetic other things. So, uh, routine examination, posterior segment should be a part of your examination also for all cataract surgery patients. So, in our case, we have a standard of doing uh, IUL master, specular and OCT yes. in all cases. Yeah, I think that, that has become the standard yeah. for all cataract patients nowadays. Now, we'd like to invite uh, Dr. Sonu Goyal from Jaipur, he's going to talk about uh, his experiences on uh, this new uh, lens by Hoya, that is a, a geometric uh, lens for a toric especially, for a stability and his experiences. Dr. Sonu Goyal, please. A very good afternoon and uh, thanks Hoya for making me part of this wonderful symposium. Thanks Chair and Professor Dr. Tial, Dr. Mahipal. Thank you so very much. Rotational stability factors affecting press biopsy correcting IOL outcomes. So uh, I'll be touching on briefly on the optics and the uh, the uh, kind of lens and the structure what this geometric gives to us. No financial interest, and uh, we all know that this uh, uh, Hoya has come up with this uh, trifocal platform, which they call it as Vivinex Geometric and Geometric Plus. So, and this is available both in the toric and the non-toric platforms. So, the optics again stand on the same uh, proven, which is the Vivinex platform. So, this is a, basically a trifocal lens with a spherical aberrating, uh, aberration correcting platform and which is very well tolerant to coma as that we have seen. They are very tolerant to tilts and the toric option is available. It's a hydrophobic acrylic material, glistening free. And uh, to our experience of uh, maybe more than uh, 2000 implants of uh, the Vivinex, uh, we have, haven't had any case of calcification as of now. So, it's a C-loop design model with the 13 millimeter diameter uh, full 6 millimeter optic 
stick and gives an excellent rotational stability that we have seen with the roughened or the textured haptic that the Vivenex Toric that we have all been using. And uh, the preloaded injector system has been outstanding and uh, has been smooth. And the delivery, what is very, very important is the consistent delivery in all ranges of the dioptric power that we've been dealing from uh, myopic to extreme hyperopic. I think it is very, very consistent. And the combination of both the push and the screw has really uh, helped in easing out the surgical and giving respect to the wound uh, for all uh, surgeons. So this geometric uh, is basically a diffractive uh, platform. It's a diffractive refractive. And the, uh, this uh, basically uh, is a 3.2 truncated area, which comprises four diffractive uh, zones. So you have the uh, negative asphericity to correct the positive cordial uh, spherical aberrations, and the intermediate add is around 1.75, and the near add is around 3.5. The diameter overall is here is six, and the overall length is around 13 millimeters. So this is uh, the refractive, and this is the, the bullseye in the center. And uh, this is uh, the design, and this is built on the proven, uh, the Vivenex uh, platform, and uh, so, you know, uh, basically it gives a full range of vision, but uh, they have come up with uh, two uh, wonderful uh, complementary designs, and this is called the Vivinex Geometric and the Geometric Plus. The whole concept is uh, you can have a paired approach for those kind of patients which uh, would require a more uh, near uh, kind of uh, vision or near quality of vision. So the Geometric Plus I'll be showing you uh, gives you an excellent uh, defocus for the near. So the near add, as I said, is 3.5, the intermediate is 1.75, and the proprietary aspheric design uh, is uh, what is banged on. And uh, this is uh, uh, the difference in the design between the geometric and the geometric plus. So uh, we all know that uh, uh, the uh, energy distribution is what is uh, the play game uh, with most of these uh, trifocal IOLs. And if you see uh, the point spread function here, so with the geometric, uh, it is the light distribution for the zero. That means for the distance is close to around 50.9%. And uh, for the near, it is around 21.8%. And intermediate is 17. So if you compare this, <coughs> with the geometric plus uh, so the light distribution for di uh, distance would be around 39.8 percent and again for near it is 38.6 percent so now this is what helps uh, the patient having an excellent uh, uh, combination of uh, one uh, if you have a paired approach the patient can have an excellent uh, distance an excellent intermediate and a very good near at 33 centimeters so uh, taking this a little forward this is what i was talking about the uh, the uh, light distribution in these patients and uh, so this is uh, the geometric when you have geometric in both the eyes you have an excellent uh, distance you have a good intermediate and you have a good near vision and if you have a geometric plus it will give you a good distance a good intermediate but an excellent in uh, near vision and a combination which is a paired approach of one eye geometric and the other eye geometric plus could, could transform into an excellent distance, a good intermediate and an excellent near vision. So that is what the combination uh, leads to and that is what the whole concept is. Now this is available in the toric platform uh, from uh, T1 to T6 and uh, so uh, the cylindrical power at the coronal plane can be corrected is maximum 2.6 diopters. And uh, since the, uh, uh, the edges are quite roughened, uh, it is very tolerant to rotation. So patient, uh, one of these patients uh, taken on a toric, uh, on a femto platform, and with the catalyst, we have these markings available. So this is the uh, toric marking, uh, which can be uh, taken on the cornea, and uh, just the rexis is pinched off. A quick run through the phaco. I would like to talk more on the lens. So this is, uh, uh, the phaco emulsification pre-chopped eight segments and uh, helps to reduce the phaco time as well as the phaco energy uh, centered rexis and uh, ELP that we talk of is very very important in all these premium patients and uh, actually the flex helps in achieving uh, the right position for all these uh, uh, premium lenses so a good irrigation aspiration and uh, So a good polishing is always I bank on 
and this is uh, the the lens uh, that we talk of and uh, so the same uh, technique the step one two three and uh, pushing in the viscoelastic pushing the cartridge forward i think the injector design we all are very habitual and the lens is very easy to inject and this is basically the optics that you see here uh, the bullseye, the truncated 3.2, and the diffractive zones that we're talking on. The lens goes and sits inside the bag, and these markings can then be actually related with the condyl marks which have been created on the catalyst platform. And uh, a good centration of these toric lenses can be achieved. So we always do a vis visco wash behind and never overhydrate the anterior chamber and we just tap so you can see the optics here what i wanted to emphasize was the uh, the optics of geometric so this is the bullseye and this is the central area and these are the uh, uh, the markings uh, of the toric and this can be quickly aligned to the condyl marks and uh, just tap the lens so that it snugs and the lens goes and remains stable inside the bag so uh, uh, this has been uh, one of the uh, landmark papers uh, by uh, the uh, European group which came out that almost 100% of the implanted lenses had less than 5 degree of rotation over a period of 6 months. Now this study was done on their proven Vivinex toric platform and since this lens is again uh, on the same platform, uh, this uh, is expected to behave uh, in a similar manner. We have a limited experience of 8-9 uh, implants and uh, with uh, half of them on toric uh, bilaterally and uh, over a period of two months the patients have been behaving excellent with the distance and near excellent vision and the lens has remained stable and uh, so we have an access to uh, uh, the eye trace where we can actually go back and check and uh, they are found to remain uh, stable there so this is a quick word of the uh, simulated optical comparisons and which demonstrates the two complementary profiles if you see here and this is basically the pupil size and depending upon the pupil size uh, you know it works uh, the uh, diffractive efficiency uh, when the pupil is large uh, excellent for far vision and similarly here this is the geometric and this is the geometric plus so the vivenix geometric and geometric plus show different light distribution profiles as the pupil size increases so the pairing can help Help and contralaterally may provide a full range of functional vision from the distance to near. So if you see, this is uh, the uh, the available trifocal uh, in the world market. So their defocus curve for a distance, intermediate and near. And what I want to exactly show is uh, this uh, defocus curve here. So if you have a patient where you have a Vivinex geometric uh, in both the eyes, and this is uh, the dotted would show uh, where you have a geometric plus in both the eyes, and this bold would show you Vivinex geometric and geometric plus. So if you see the defocus curve here with one eye geometric and the other eye geometric plus, this is uh, what is achieved for distance, this is what is for the intermediate, and this for the near. So to uh, summarize, I think a paired approach in uh, most of these patients would work well and would be provided an excellent distance, excellent intermediate, and uh, excellent near vision. So uh, much more to come uh, in the period. Uh, a limited study done by the European group which came out for 80 eyes and uh, which showed uh, this kind of uh, defocus curve in their experience. So thank you very much. speaker is Dr. Uh, C. Vavekar. Uh, he's going to be talking about range of vision with PCIOLs, my experience. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to talk on range of vision with PCIOL. Uh, so these are my financial interests. So when we started, uh, like few years back, we used to say that cataract is a refractive surgery. But today, it is not only refractive surgery, a patient wants to have very good vision at different distances, at most of the distances. And if we uh, clarify, try to clarify further, there is quality of vision, range of vision, and it should be without glasses. Without glasses is given if there is no emetropia, 
then the matter ends there. It is pre essential prerequisite. Now, range of vision and quality vision cannot be separated together. But uh, so let's see how they work in comparison to each other. So what are the current visual needs? We have people with different professions coming. The most important thing is understanding the profile of the patient. So if he's a dentist or a, you know, person who is doing a lot of tailoring work, then ultra near vision, which is about one feet is 0.5 to one feet is very, very important. Then the, of course, the reading, uh, including some tablets and mobiles and, uh, you know, uh, all the small house chores which are required, you require a good near vision. Then intermediate vision, uh, car dashboard, computer, and musical instruments, etc. For that, you require this intermediate. Then there is distance intermediate vision, which is around eight to ten feet, for where you are doing uh, watching the television. And lastly, is the distance at infinity, which is still, uh, essential for driving and sports. So um, inter intermediate uh, tasks are often done at arm's length. And that was a study by OSHA, which said that 40 to 80 centimeters was the ideal distance where everybody wants a crisp uh, you know, vision. And that is the least compromisable uh, range after uh, the distance. And therefore, most of the lenses started concentrating on the, this. But as the time when we, we, we got id off lenses where, you know, there was an extended depth of focus and we are marching on. So monofocal, as you know, patient does not require glasses only for distance. Then there was a bifocal, which we used to call multifocal, where computer working on computer and tablet was a problem. Then we have got trifocal. And it is just going on and on where the range is increasing. Uh, now, what are the changes over the years? The balancing act. Number one is that we referred, uh, shifted from refractive to diffractive. And then we shifted to refractive, diffractive, apodized, which increased the range as well as quality of vision. Then we, have, we are doing jugglery with the number of rings. So now these are the lenses with different types of number of rings. As you increase the rings, as you increase the stay height, as you make them truncated, you are getting different kind of vision. So uh, what has been thought is that today perhaps all the lenses within the rings, uh, number of rings between 8 to 15, they are the ones who are uh, working the best in terms of quality of vision for distance at night and in terms of um, quantity of vision. Then we come to the central zone. As you can see that initially the central zone or the bullseye was very small. Uh, but when the angle alpha came into picture, we, uh, everybody started realizing that we require a bigger central zone. And as the time is going on, we are increasing. But uh, most of the current lenses have a, a central zone of around 1.1.6 to 1.2 millimeters. Now, there are some lenses with a bigger zone, that is Symphony, Synergy, VVT where the, the bullseye is more, but then there is a compromise on the near vision. So they, uh, it is important to understand the profile of the patient and act accordingly, uh, choose the lens accordingly. Then comes the design. So we had bifocal lenses first, then trifocal and then quadrifocal, where the number of uh, diffractive rings and their height was increased. And in quadrifocal, the last step was truncated so that the vision uh, that uh, light was parted for distance thereby improving the quality of vision for distance then let us look at the defocus curve the one of the first trifocal lenses came is this uh, lens zeiss uh, acrylic tree where in addition to the distance and near the graft which is at the uh, defocus of say 1.5 to 2 minus was lifted slightly and then came fine vision lens where it was a hydrophilic model first and hydrophobic model first, uh, then uh, which showed further improvement in the that intermediate uh, important zone. Then came panoptics where there was further improvement in the zone. But all these uh, patients somewhere or the other kept on complaining about halos. So you will get one of patient where the halos and glare will be there at night. And then uh, there was a symphony Again, a ring issue was there, but uh, intermediate zone was uh, good, but patient required reading glasses.
and then we have synergy where the situation is improved further so uh, like the way it, it is going we are improving upon the results and patient are getting not only good quality of vision but better range of vision uh, same uh, uh, vvt comes in the same bracket but what we have today is uh, the geometric and geometric plus it's a new concept and it's very interesting concept dr sonu goel has made my life easier so uh, we had twin set lenses before but wa one was dedicated extremely for the uh, you know distance and the one was too much for near and then uh, both the has had to work together in case of geometry that is not a case the in geometric lens even though it is meant for uh, distance dominance the near vision is also quite good and in case of geometric plus even though it is uh, meant for near the distance vision is also quite good and the temporal summation of the two lenses becomes very good and the range of patient uh, vision patient gets is uh, quite uh, good now if you look at there are small two bumps in the center okay uh, these two bumps are important so these are the distances like 8 feet 10 feet or you know uh, something beyond the dashboard these are the distances where we do not require uh, very fine vision we require gross vision uh, but the quality has to be good now these two small bumps are giving that quality of vision and therefore truly this lens is capable of giving a uh, very good range of vision all throughout the distances of course our uh, experience is quite limited and we will have to see in future how this works but right now the results appear to be quite promising and this is what i was talking about dr sonugal already showed this slide so i will skip this and again as the pupil becomes small uh, you know, on the one side is geometric lens the black uh, graph is of distance as you can see the when the pupil goes beyond 3 the light required for uh, given for distance increases whereas in geometric plus the yellow is the one which is for near and it is from the beginning it is around uh, 35 40% it is to be precise 38% and as the pupil dilates beyond 3 mm the energy for near drops down because when you are reading the pupil definitely becomes smaller and for distance vision the pupil is larger in size so the lens works on the basis of temporal summation now we there is another concept that if the person is working exclusively in the near conditions or room light conditions we can employ geometric uh, plus in both the eyes but these are the early days to come to that conclusion right now let us stick to geometric in one eye and geometric in plus eye the another important point is that there is no need to understand dominance so it is not necessary that you have to put a uh, geometric lens in dominant eye and geometric plus in the non dominant eye because as i said already that even though it is geometric meant basically for distance the near vision is also quite good and uh, same true for geometric plus that even though it is meant for mainly for near the distance vision is quite good so there is no need to change uh, check uh, dominance of the patient now again this slide was showed by dr um, uh, sonu goel i will uh, what i would like to comment here is that even though all these lenses uh, you know show almost similar graph it is very important therefore to understand the profile of the patient what are his needs and then choose a lens accordingly and all these lenses are uh, giving us different options different combination of ranges of vision we, we are kind of spoiled for choices but one way it is good also because we can give patient exactly what he wants thank you thank you dr vivekar uh... i would have these questions for both you and uh, dr sulu uh, this seems to be a completely different uh, revolutionary concept all along we have been thinking about uh, playing with the power of the intraocular lens that's being placed in the eye but now it's uh, more a distribute light distribution which is being talked about uh, how do you think this is going to be better than comparing a say putting in a lens with a plus 3 add and a plus 3.5 or a plus 4 add um conceptually you will think that that's what will work better rather than just uh, playing with the light conditions uh yes sir i think it will work better it is not that we have implanted too many lenses but whatever patients we have done and uh, binocularly it looks like they require little less the light for reading with these lenses as compared to the competitors so it this light decision seems to be helping the patients somewhere your inputs 
So I think that's a very nice question. Even I also was into that thought process. So very limited experience of maybe a couple of cases that we have done so far. So I think that light distribution would take care of that loss of contrast, which you know actually is happening with this, most of these uh, press biopic connecting lenses. And an add of 3.5 is just trying to give you a magnification, but that doesn't give you actually the, the contrast which is actually required. So I think with the graph and the defocus curve that they're trying to show, so I think uh, the uphill with the near, with the geometric plus, so that actually is, you know, uh, not, not compromising the distance vision, though the light distribution falls, but actually gives you a little more uh, on the near part. I think the transition like from multifocal to trifocals uh, was basically based on the light distribution and that's why they were able to create that, uh, you know, the intermediate kind of uh, light uh, distribution curve. So I think uh, it's a way forward uh, towards that only. I think the um, most developments in multifocal, trifocal technology is towards uh, reducing the amount of dysphotopsia. And uh, the less the light that is uh, not utilized, that is the one which is causing problems. Like when we went down from 82% light utilization to 88% light utilization, even our conventional trifocals had an advantage. What is the light utilization in these cases? Is it, is it much higher? 89%. Huh? 89 Okay, maybe that's one of the reasons why. Slightly more, yeah. And the other concern I had was, you know, the central diffractive rings are only in the uh, central three millimeters. Or? 3.2. 3.2. Yeah. So you know, uh, some of our the lenses we are familiar with went from 3.6 to 4.5 millimeters because they said that when the pupils expand, then the in mesopic conditions, the near vision will be dropping down, and that's our experience also. That's why they talk about a full diffractive lens. Here, actually, you have gone ahead and reduced the zone of diffractive rings. Uh, how does this work in uh, uh, dim light conditions as far as the near yeah. vision is concerned? Uh, so again, it's a, it's a very interesting question. See, uh, right now, our uh, you know experience is quite limited, but I think that we will have to uh, compare the lenses, the quality of, and range of vision vis-a-vis -vis the pupil size. And then we'll come to know whether 3.2 is good enough or you require really require 4.5. So it's too early, but I think that you know there will be some type of patient for whom this will be a good option, at least. So maybe in these patients, the greater light distribution for near will help. Definitely, I think we cannot substitute the increasing from 3.25 to 3.5 with changing in the light distribution. They are two totally different principles. But in mesopic conditions, when the pupil dilates, then definitely distance vision will be better. But for near, the increased light distribution for near probably will help. And ease of reading, more importantly. Yes. The speed of reading uh, and the ease and of reading. Uh, so inherent to these lenses is a differential light distribution. You, do you think that doing a bit of a micro monovision, in the sense that making a, a one, the non-dominant eye, a plus 0.5, will add to this and uh, increase the quality of vision? So I don't I think, think so. The, so in this patient, we have... pretty good as such, I mm -hmm. think. So it's not a question of doing a monovision uh, there. The only thing is that in dim light, uh, dim light conditions, that's where... See, all these lenses are working very well in good light conditions. All trifocals are. So it's just a question that uh, the light distribution, mm -hmm. if you increase that for near, I think that will uh, summate it up for the... Uh, uh, when there is a low light condition, then, then therefore you can have through the day uh, good uh, outcomes. So I don't personally think I don't have much experience. Actually, I haven't implanted a single geometric so far. But uh, I, from a context of the the way the lens is designed and all, I don't think we'll need to do a micro monovision because you already you are with a plus four. You are like here. So if you're doing a monovision like that's like a plus four, so that's not, that's not the optimal distance that is there. Yeah. So I think it's I think the light uh, which is uh, basically low light condition which is causing the trouble in other lenses which they uh, tend to address by doing one eye giving more light for near in dim light condition. So up till now I've had no surprises uh, regarding refractive error. But uh, suppose we get an, a patient where we are living live in a we are left behind a plus 0 0.25 or plus 0 0.5, then only I will consider uh, mono micro, like mono ma micro vision, otherwise not. Can we have that slide which we were showing for the pupil size? No, uh, obviously, 
all along with all the multifocals, trifocals that we have, uh, we have been buying vision for all distances using the currency of contrast. So whenever you talk about vision for all distances, there's the contrast which goes down. This lens, I think, uh, is a fairly disruptive technology in the sense that uh, it's not talking about just power or just the number of rings or something, but it's talking about light distribution, which has not been addressed by any of the other lenses which have been currently available to us. So of course, it's very initial experience, all these uh, surgeons are sharing, but over time, it will tell us that uh, whether this is the right way to proceed. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Dr. Sonu wanted to explain yeah. something. Yes, so, uh, basically, the Mike, efficiency, Mike. No, sir. So if you actually see the diffractive efficiency, you know, the, as the pupil size increases, you know, it increases from almost 40 to 60 percent from 3.5 to 4.5. But there is hardly any fall if you see from 3.5 to 4.5. It's a very, very minimal uh, uh, fall in the diffractive efficiency. I think uh, that is the, the, the key for that, you know, the size keeping uh, uh, close to 3.2. Thank you, Dr. Vavekar. Now, uh, I call upon the next speaker, Dr. Anagarur, and she's going to be talking about patient testimonials, PCIOLs, four-in-one one multi cert loaded injector system. A very good afternoon to all of you. Very good afternoon to all of you. So I would be sharing my experience with these lenses. So first of all, I would like to say that these are the lenses that I've used around uh, 16 lenses so far. And if you can see the ones that are highlighted out of these, there are around five that are Torix and four patients who have a combination of geometric in one eye and geometric plus in the other eye. I'd like you to see the last three columns, the distance vision, the near, and the intermediate for all of these patients. And I was pleasantly surprised and very, very happy to see that all of these had a 6-6 six, six, N6 six in all of these distances. So these were some of my surgical experiences also. We have used these monofocal Wavenex lenses for the last so many years and with uh, very, very uh, great smoothness and with ease with which it actually uh, opens up into the eye. The consistency with which it really, uh, each of these lenses, whether it's a high diopteric power or a low diopteric power and the kind of optical clarity it gives is absolutely amazing. So this was the patient post-op and this was, can we have the sound please? That's why I had asked for this sound. My dad don't need an operation. I have to set up a recurrent leap at the operation. And operation is a T-shirt successful. I mean, the most important operation is robotic, imported multifocal lens. I mean, it's a T-shirt success. 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 नंतर सजा प्रकार से काम करो शक्ति आड़ी है ऑपरेशन होता ना हमने कोंटिया ही प्रकार से त्रास जला नहीं आता ही नहीं एकदम कोंटिया है आने इतने असली जगह को इतना स्टाफ मैडम या सगाई से तत्ती से सुंदर प्रकार एक ऑपरेशन इतने हमारा ढाले गया है तुम्हारे तुम्हारा ऐसा बात है तो शक्ति हम तुम्हारा बारिक अपना बारिक सुधा� बिहार लाइट मोबाइल में किसी का काम करो शक्ति आई मैं कौन कौन आले ऑपरेशन मैं ये मल्टीपोकल ब्रेड के तू मतलब तू फाइल जाते थे लेकिन ये तू नहीं ऐसे काम करता कंप्यूटर वैसे काम करता ऑफिस में जब ना बारिक ब्रेड काम करा तो सही था टेंटर से कि मल्टीपोकल लेंस बस वाला काइंस करती है म so they say the proof of the pudding lies in eating it and then definitely these patients were extremely happy. Now this patient where we used a femto technology and a geometric plus with uh, Torek was actually a local corporator, a local politician where definitely you all know how the demands are very high and we have to be absolutely uh, bang on not only with the biometry, with the surgical technique as well as with the results and definitely counseling in all these patients become extremely important. So here we were fine with the surgery, we were fine with the lens. So let's see what he had to say. Can we have the sound please? <laughs> 
भोपाल नागपूर आसाम so this was another patient where the pupil was slightly on the lower side and the patient was a case of ifis so we decided not to take a chance and along with uh, the uh, geometric that we had planned we also decided to use a b hex so that we don't have a problem on table and then this was post op the rest of the surgery was as routine this was a geometric with a toric and this was the patient multifocal uh, lenses are jata mane tumhala jawal cha pan disu shakta ani lamb cha pan disu shakta tumhala mag chashma vapraychi avashyakta nahi jithe tumcha dodyachi sampurna equipmental chachni hote ti keli jithe tumhala ha lens chi suitability pan samajte tumhi multifocal lens tumhala vapraycha ahe ka tuma to suit hoil ki nahi तर त्याच्यामध्ये मला सांगण्यासारखी गोष्ट अशी वाटते की एवढी ऍडव्हान्स दिस गोज टू से हाऊ पेशंट ऍक्च्युली अंडरस्टँड द काइंड ऑफ टेस्टिंग दॅट वी डू प्री ऑपरेटिव्हली दे अंडरस्टँड वॉट अ मल्टीफोकल मीन्स सो काउन्सिलिंग इज रिअली व्हेरी इम्पॉर्टंट इन दिस पेशंट मला वाटतं आपण याला वर्ड क्लास वर्ड क्लास टेक्नॉलॉजी म्हणू शकतो अशा पद्धतीचं हे इथे या हॉस्पिटलमधली अवेलेबिलिटी इथला एक्सपर्ट हा हे बघा हे एकदम एकदम छोट जे आहे हे नंबर सिक्स ओरिसा पंजाब बिहार आसाम दिस वॉज अनदर पेशंट वेअर दी एस्टिग्मॅटिझम वॉज अराउंड पॉईंट सेव्हन फाईव्ह अँड अदरवाईज वी वुड हॅव प्लॅन टू यूज अ टी टू फॉर दिस पेशंट बट द पेशंट वॉज नॉट अफोर्डिंग so we went ahead and did a femto relaxing incision as you can see here rest of the surgery was the same so this was the femto relaxing incision also and this was the patient ani mala bharatle bharatle me lens natle karan mala chashma nako hota ya hatle mule mala ekdam swasht disay lagla घरी टी व्ही म्हणा मोबाईल म्हणा घरचे कामं करताना म्हणा आणि वाचन करताना म्हणा खूप मला स्पष्ट दिसायला लागलं हे हे तुम्हाला मी वाचून दाखवते आपल्या भौतीचे जग सुंदर करतात आणि आपल्याला ह्या म्हणजे मला बारीकले बारीक अक्षर मला वाचायला यायला लागलं एकदम स्पष्ट दिसायला लागलं डोळ्यावर काही बँडेज नाही काही नाही नॉर्मल चष्मा प्रमाणे मी बाहेर आलो आणि मला दिसायला लागलं मला इकडे तिकडे पण विचारलं की तुम्ही ऑपरेशन केलं का काय केलं विषय बारीक चांगल्या प्रकारे वाचू शकतो आज तर दुसरा दिवस आहे त्यामुळे मला खूप आनंद झालाय माझं ऑपरेशन अतिशय सक्सेसफुल झालेलं आहे ते अक्षर अतिशय बारीक आहे परंतु मी चष्माला लावता जो चष्मा समोर लावलेला आहे तो झिरो नंबरचा आहे हॉस्पिटलचा डिअर सर दिस हॅज रेफरन्स टू द व्हिजिट ऑफ द अंडर साईन ॲट युअर हॉस्पिटल प्रिमा मी आता कॉम्प्युटर देखील ट्राय करून पाहिला की मला पेपर तर वाचता येतो पण कॉम्प्युटर वाचता येत ठीक नाही आणि म्हणून मी कॉम्प्युटर तिथे ऑन आहे माझ्या समोर आणि त्याचे अक्षर जे चांगलं दिसतं पहिल्याचे म्हणजे वेटिंग पेशंट सो फ्रेंड्स द प्रूफ ऑफ द पुडिंग लाईज इन ईटिंग इट वी वर हॅपी दॅट आर पेशंट डिड वेल अँड ऑब्विसली कन्सेंट हॅज बीन टेकन ऑफ ऑल दिस पेशंट बिफोर वी आर प्रेझेंटेड टू यू हिअर केअरफुल प्री ऑपरेटिव्ह selection of the patients a precise surgical technique good counseling of these patients definitely goes a very long way in getting greater success for these patients we have finally happy surgeons and happy patients we are already used to the great uh, technological advancements in the preloaded technology that we have today with the, these trifocals the continuous range of vision over the distance intermediate and the near that these ha- lenses have provided us 
and the crispness in the near vision specifically with all these lenses thank you so much for your kind attention thank you dr anagha for that uh, very nice presentation i think this uh, set of videos were as much and please stay there as much an advertisement for anila hospital as for the lens per se but uh, what i noticed was that uh, all these lenses uh, all these patients were essentially giving a testimonial for looking at different distances distance near and intermediate etc they seem to be very happy with it yes but, sir, uh, we are more concerned about the quality of vision i mean i didn't hear any of them talking about uh, whether they experience any dysphotopsia glare halos so they didn't and they didn't have any dysphotopsia they didn't complain uh, you have obviously used uh, all the multifocals trifocals do you think i mean what is the extra that this lens uh, this combination brings on to the table sir even in all our other patients the percentage of patients having dysphotopsia is not greater than say 10 15% all of these patients were very happy with the quality of vision also the ease with which they could read if that lady if you could see she was reading n5 so the ease with which she could read made her very happy the question of dysphotopsia may come probably later on but as of now none of these patients have complained of any glare or halos or poor quality of vision they were happy that they were able to read the basic criteria of all these patients was that they wanted to read without glasses simple and that was what they got and that made them happy so i think the uh, intent and the aim of giving them independence from glasses even though they were counseled pre beforehand that they could probably like we do for all multifocals so they achieved and they got what they wanted and that made them happy and that was what i thought we should share also how we select these patients if you saw the, why i put in all these patients were that patients also understand the kind of work up that you do for them that it is something more than a routine lens that lady who was saying that she had to go through so many tests even though they have to pay for it they understand that there are special tests and special work ups that are being done so i think that is very important that they are counseled and they go through all of this so that they understand that we have done something better for them yeah uh, anaga uh, yes it's a good presentation but uh, since uh, i mean you also have your limitations because uh, uh, you have only used and there's no long follow up but then if like ramu says if you really want that then what was that extra that using a combination of uh, geometric and geometric plus gave uh, you know that doesn't obviously you don't expect it to come out Uh, from their uh, you know their uh, these uh, reviews because it's ba basically based on uh, you know the reading for near and distance probably it would come out of uh, maybe you know because they are all fresh post ops after that when you are out in the field and then maybe after a month or two you do their test and find out their contrast and you know find out exact distance at which you know that probably definitely sir these are all early results yeah, yeah, i am not saying that yeah. we have got these lenses only in the last yeah, yeah, few no, no, we weeks so yeah. definitely see i am just sharing what we got the results that we got uh, as of now that means it proves that these are really good lenses as far as giving good vision at different distances yes was there any reason for you to choose a different a combination of these in definitely the sir because the geometric and geometric plus as we saw in the earlier uh, talks also the geometric plus gives you a greater light distribution for near 39% compared to the geometric plane so if we use a combination then the clarity for near the because the light distribution is better is more and the patients can read more easily but that when you checked uniocularly did you uh, could demonstrate so these that? were all binocular patients no 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 oh. yeah like in the eye where there was only geometric uh, did you see something that was less than when it was in a combination so we did not want to tell the patient that oh. because you know we don't want to instill in their uh, minds that there is something different between the two eyes thank you thank you dr naga it is my pleasure to request uh, dr mayapal sachdev to give his talk on enhanced monofocal need of the eye 
thank you namta uh, but before i go on uh, suhas to your question see the point is that uh, bifocal lenses or multifocality has been there since uh, uh, 97 or 98 when we got them on the pmma platform so whatever has happened over time is changing and these are going to be small incremental steps the, nothing one single lens is not going to be transformational so you got the aspheric coming in then you got the achromaticity coming in and now you are having a different light distribution coming in so i think these are small steps which are in uh, directions which can obviously these are different ways of looking uh, but at the end of the day i think the neural adaptation is going to play a long part uh, you must have seen i have at least seen that the amount of time i spend on a counseling to tell a patient about dysphotopsia that i have reduced uh, it used to be much more it used to hit you i haven't explanted a single uh, zeiss trifocal or a synergy uh, panoptics i have limited experience but none of these i have explanted but uh, when you looked at earlier when you were doing the bifocals you could actually be ending up in explanting some of them so all these things are going towards reducing this photopsia and increasing the quality of uh, light uh, transmission and uh, the acceptability so they i think these are transformational small steps and yes as you said uh, the jury is still going to be out it might take a little while and yes uh though she did not compare it would be worthwhile to compare between a plus and a normal as to in reading uh, between the two eyes can you make out a difference and how is it helping you in dim light conditions so actually low contrast contrast sensitivity charts are going to help you that's what i feel okay uh so i'll be talking about something less controversial uh i think uh, this thing came up uh, a uh, couple of years ago and uh, at least in my practice uh, what is called as a monofocal plus or now this is being called as an enhanced monofocal has overtaken the entire uh, practice of my monofocal lenses i they instead of monofocal we are going because the price differential is not too high and i really don't know uh, how it will be for this particular lens which is there so the basic thing is that the monofocal io options today the current day uh, monofocals obviously have the restriction of only giving good distance vision and reading vision is a problem and the patient's visual requirements have changed significantly and are going to change significantly so when you are looking at today's world obviously lot of us on the dais maybe people in the audience lot of them are on their smartphones even when they are listening to lectures and things like that so the 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 kind of requirement that you have for an intermediate uh, vision is pretty high everything is on the go today you can see that newspapers uh, have declined significantly in their uh circulations but the same is now available online so the online version that everything your time your smart uh, spending on the gadgets has increased and therefore if there is a lens which does not have any dysphotopsias if there is a lens where you don't have to do any mix match you don't have to come out with new rationales that i am going to increase the light uh, light distribution or i am going to uh give a monovision or etc etc so those are possibly something which is important and uh, this is the new lens which is still not available in india but that uh, just to give you a peek into what this lens is going to offer and that is the vivenex impress uh this is the uh, new addition over the hoya vivenex it's going to be on the same platform but it's being called as the impress which is there so you had as i just said just now you had the foldable lens with the design and the optical properties which were there uh, you had the spherical which all of us realized that sphericity giving a spherical abrasion onto an eye where the lens is being taken out is actually counterintuitive and then you went on to the aspherical monofocal as of now the chromanine technology which is uh, a patent for jnj is being given only in their trifocal or the synergy lens it is not there now they are coming up in their symphony equivalent with the chromaline technology but this chromaline technology is basically looking at the achromaticity or the chromatic abrasions that are there so you have spherical abrasions and you have chromatic abrasions so hopefully that will also come in the monofocal sphere which is there 
So when you are talking of a normal monofocal lens, uh, when you are achieving target emetropia, that's what we generally tend. And then obviously, as Dr. Ramamurthy was saying, you can look at monovision, etc., etc. You get good distance vision. Intermediate starts to fade, and when you look at the near vision, uh, it tends to really uh, go off. So that is the problem and the patient's visual requirement, as I told you over the past few years, uh, our kids uh, or actually our grandkids are totally uh, talking about uh, near intermediate vision and being on gadgets all day. But supposing in our own life, uh, we have to look at uh, if you have uh, to drive or you have to do a Google map, etc. So these are things that you have to have a good distance vision as also you need to have an intermediate vision. This is not near near vision, but it's an intermediate vision that you have. Uh, even your kitchens have changed for because we are heading 80%, 90% of ophthalmologists as women. So even their kitchens now today have modularity and you have to look at it. And then when you go shopping again, there is a lot of difference where intermediate vision is there. Everything today is digital. Uh, gaming, uh, as somebody was saying in another session that uh, Mataji se ke bhai, aapne ka kuch kaam karte hai. Wo hai, akhbar to nahi padte, but they are still playing with the games, the video games for four hours a day or six hours. That's the way to keep them happy. So uh, this is something which is uh, again important and entertainment as I told you has shifted to an intermediate from a, uh, going to a movie hall to a television and now to a tablet or even your smartphone. So these are the daily activities that any individual is doing. And obviously, if you look at it, majority of the times what you need is an intermediate vision. Neither do you need majority of the time a distance vision, nor do you use the majority of the times a near vision. So it's the intermediate vision that we are looking at. So the new advancements, as we talked about, are what is uh, an enhanced monofocal, which has been introduced by one of the leading uh, companies. I think that is the only one when this will be possibly the second company to come out with the enhanced monofocal. Uh, I uh, would uh, suspect that this is what it is. It will give you some amount of intermediate vision. And then here, if you do a, a mini monovision, dominant eye for distance and non-dominant eye, you leave a minus 0.5, etc. Patients are pretty happy in a competitor's IUL uh, that is done and you don't really need to give them uh, any near ad which is there. So intermediate visual equity as of things stand today is uh, really of uh, great importance uh, to us and the outcomes therefore would depend on managing expectation. The biggest thing is that I don't talk to the patient when I'm talking on the monofocal plus lens. The price difference is only two, three, four thousand. I don't know, remember the exact one. So I don't even tell them that I'm putting a separate lens. I don't tell them what is the expectation that they should have. The only thing is that I am very sure that the addition that a patient instead of it being 2.75 or 2.5 goes down significantly to 1.5 or 1.75. And if you do a monovision with bilateral summation, uh, the patient is often spectacle independent. I have done it in my own person, brother's uh, eye for this. And I think in one eye he had a monofocal, the other I have done that and he finds the perceptible difference in the intermediate vision that is there. Uh, Pre-op conditions, considerations are the same. If you need toricity, you will do that. Ocular surface needs to be good, etc., etc. But there is nothing more than that, that you have to look at the pre-op conditions. Uh, you can do it even in cases which has a bad macula. Doesn't matter. You can do it uh, for any kind of other, like you do a monofocal lens. Uh, IUL power selection, as I told you, you are aiming at emetropia in the dominant eye and you can look at doing a monovision, a minus 0.5. We'll, once we, I haven't laid hands on it and post-operatively you have to look. So this is just a peek into the lens which is going to be on the same platform as the Vivinex uh, called as Impress Aspheric Monofocal, uh, the new addition in the platform which Actually, what it is going to do, they haven't given me any slides, so I really don't know. I can't, uh, I'm not supposed to be knowing proprietary information as such, but this is something which is equivalent to, uh, if I'm allowed to say the name, iHands. So this is uh, the answer of OAR to an equivalent of JNJ's iHands, I suppose, maybe better. I don't know how it is, but this is what it is. This is a preloaded optic design, as you all know, this is the same as the Vivinix. Uh, and uh, hydrophobic acrylic uh, diameter 6 and 13 
and it will come in powers of 6 to 13 and then you will have later on the toric variety as of now they are talking about the spherical variety which is there and uh, it will go in through a 2.2 millimeter uh, uh, injection of the wound so this is all that i have to say about the information uh, of this new lens that's going to be available in their armamentarium by the name of uh, impress so thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for that uh, excellent presentation. I think one thing uh, we need to discuss is, is about the multi-cert uh, preloaded injector system. So uh, we all have used it and we all agree it's very good. Would you like to comment on it? Oh, I think these uh, multi-cert injector systems uh, for all companies are uh, coming out with newer designs. Earlier someone gets stuck, you could actually break the haptase, etc. But I think this is a very uh, unique kind of a system where uh, you just put a little bit of HUFC or even fluid and you can inject it. It's been a 100% controlled injection of the... Uh, material uh, you have both the types so the screw type is always something that I prefer because the jerk is not there otherwise if you're doing with a plunger at times we have uh, only the other day Ram was showing a video in which he said a lens injured so it's basically with other I myself uh, for a speaker of one of the assemblies put a, this thing and the surgeon was standing next to me a panoptics and just went in with these things so I don't uh, prefer uh, the one uh, which is uh, the push type so and uh, screw type injector is fine and a single piece where uh, you don't have to it's a preloaded lens so the sturdy uh, precautions have uh, not to be uh, sturdy precautions have to be taken but then you don't have to pick out a lens and put it, put it into the, this thing and uh, what is there is that there should be uh, the uh, each time that you are putting a lens it should open in a particular manner without any damage to the haptics or the optics. So I'm pretty happy with the uh, preloaded injector system. Can I make a comment? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So basically, I think, sir, what you were saying about the jerky uh, movement of the lens when it comes out, it's basically because of these are the injectors which are re-sterilized again and again. Sometimes if they are not cleaned or there is a layer of old visco or whatever, we, over time they become jerky. The best advantage of these preloaded are because it's a one-time use, this problem would never occur. Never once have I ever felt with the Vivinex platform or the multi-cert any kind of jerk, no matter what the dipteric power. So I think the advantage is because it's a one-time use, probably that difficulty we would not face. Apart from what is mentioned, to my mind, the other advantage also is the ease with which this goes in even through a 2.2 millimeter incision. Very often we do a wound-assisted implantation just to limit the size of the incision, but these uh, cartridges, the tips uh, slip into the anterior chamber so that they're able to inject almost at the mouth of the capsular excess. And that gives you a much better control also. And uniformly, all these lenses becoming available in this platform is a, a step forward. But I always, you know, whether this monofocal plus, I feel is a compromise solution. I know this is for patients who are who want some kind of a multifocality, but at the same time, they're scared about the dysphotopsia component. So with the uh, concepts like the geometry coming in, maybe we would be really uh, be in a position to give uh, true multifocality without a compromise in uh, the quality of vision. So Ram, as things stand today, I think premium IOLs are less than 10, 15, 20% of the practice. In some places, it might be higher. Uh, but if you look at a, a global level or if you look at a pan-India level, the toris, toric lenses, plus the uh, press wire corrected lenses, they don't form more than 15-20% of the sales of the company. So once you are very sure, see, the idea is that at a time when with your eyes closed, you can say that I am going to put a, uh, this particular trifocal lens and there will be no other problems, etc., like you do for a monofocal. That's the time when you have really conquered the thing. So the problems are still there at times and there is so much that is written on the digital media that patients often ask you and which is uh, today that's what I'm feeling that maybe there has been a lot more hype that has been created about the problem because that does not apply to the present generation press by IPR correcting lenses as it applied to a plus four that we had earlier and things like that. So I think things are changing pretty fast and yes, uh, obviously then... Uh, Hyperopic LASIK or press beyond would be out, 
and uh, you will be doing our prelex for that and let's hope that that's the next big thing for ophthalmologists to happen over the next 5 7 years so i think there is a special subset of patients where either they don't afford a multifocal or a trifocal like geometric or those patients where you would not put a trifocal knowingly because they have some kind of macular problem or a post keratotic refractive patient so there are those patients where you can give them an extended depth of vision like an intermediate which they would want knowingly that they would need a reader so that subset of patients are going to be there i don't think the entire thing would be converted to a multifocal i think the prices will come down over time that's for sure and once prices come down then we can So with this, we come to the close of the session. Are there any comments or questions? Yes, Dr. Shekhar. I just want some suggestions from the panel. Uh, with these extended depth of focus lenses, the Diahans and the VVT, there would be a need for around plus one to one point five for near correction. Uh, when we are giving progressives, patients are not happy. so many of them uh, don't tolerate progressives uh, for reading they are okay with progressive but the same spectacle for distance will give lot of blurring both distance and intermediate are you facing similar challenges or what are the solutions uh, most of the time i end up giving them single vision reading glasses yeah that's right i mean you are uh, uh, even the initial counseling for these patients is that majority of your activities you would be able to do without the need for glasses but if you want to do serious reading then a pair of readers would be necessary and uh, as you rightly say um, most often we don't give progressives but just a uh, uh, readers which they can use as and when they want and as was told by the uh, speakers today also our requirement for actual book reading or reading up close is coming down and even uh, cell phone you can always increase the font size or increase the illumination so majority of these patients are able to uh, manage but having said that i personally uh, am more a user of monofocals or true multifocals which gives uh, good vision for all distances and i confine these monofocal plus lenses only to those patients like uh, glaucoma armd uh, post refractive surgery where maybe a multifocal is a relative contraindication but uh, at the same time there is some one some kind of an ad, ad over the monofocals ramu my point so, was whether these patients are contraindicated for uh, progressives no no that's fine uh, what you are talking about progressive so they don't actually need progressive because this they just need good intermediate so they can have the see uh, sir question is to... not they needing sir the question is whether if somebody doesn't like the reader kind of a style if they want to go for progressive for reading itself just for reading uh, this thing uh, they are not tolerant for the distance part of it but that's a zero power normally they get for distance no, no but zero will start progressing yeah i understand and that it starts kicking in and they are not comfortable sir actually so i would notice that and maybe bangalore has a uh, lot of them <laughs> but i really don't know i have i haven't really looked at it uh, from that perspective but just to ca carry on from where dr ram said uh, edops is almost out of my practice today i am not using much of edops uh, and i am not using even uh, monofocal lenses my practice is either you go on to trifocals or you go on to uh, the extended monofocal so that's uh, basically my practice which is there because i have replaced all my so monofocal this terminology is some trifocal people they are using edops trifocal Yeah, yeah, that's I fine. think that's that the a, terminology that's is also very different. That's a combination, but a pure EDOF, which is basically giving you some intermediate vision with a high cost, uh, you are getting almost eighty percent of that with an enhanced monofocal. That's and without any dysphotopsia. So that's uh, basically, and you you don't need to have anything about dysphotopsia. Even when Symphony came in, or even when Vivity has come in, it's not that they have zero dysphotopsias. so there is a breakage of light in any case in them also even though it's an extended focus but progressive thing maybe i can go back and see i have uh, i can really check because majority are monofocal i have never seen a patient come back to me saying that i cannot tolerate progressive after a enhanced monofocal has been given to them so we'll check up thank you sir thank you yes sir this is a very common question means we are attending so many seminars multifocal trifocal ultimately while going we get confused what lens we should put one 
second if you are given a chance to put the lens uh, your speaker uh. what lens you will prefer to your eye surgeon you put me this lens please so accordingly Sir, we can convince our patient i will put without hesitation an enhanced monofocal in uh, any ophthalmic surgeon till date uh, i have not put i have operated several ophthalmic surgeons maybe it's my disbelief in the trifocals or the bifocals i have not put even in a single one of them nor in any operating cardiologist or cardiothoracic or an orthopedician so i am today my lens of choice for a operating surgeon has been an enhanced monofocal that's enhanced my monofocal. yeah that's Thank my you. choice i uh, i think and Dr. for Ramam near vision you will be given some addition number yeah yeah but I, see I once have... you are operating or once you are even in the microscope you don't need near vision right so at that particular time so even from the operating surgeons or a cardiac surgeon or something the distance is where you need some amount of intermediate vision that's about it they're pretty happy and they say out in public forums that this guy fixed my eye and now i am uh, pretty good so that's uh, uh, what i am doing indirectly i just wanted to because enhanced mo monofocal they are little cheaper than your bifocal and other lenses oh sure enough they are uh, hardly as uh, uh, expensive as 6 7000 So I don't know what these guys would be, but I was able to impress to J and J in their global advisory board. Ram was also there to not price it too high, and uh, they have just they are running short of those lenses. They have they are uh, they have totally cannibalized into their technus one. So I don't know what impress would be uh, would I be priced. I think uh, at. the where people are there, it's extremely important that they price it right. You know, yeah. I think that's where J and J got it right in the sense that uh, we could offer this little extra at a little extra cost. but to answer your specific question about what uh, would be the choice of lens that you would implant uh, this answer keeps changing on a year to year basis simply because so many newer and newer options better lenses are coming up i personally have implanted trifocal lenses in gynecologists orthopedicians ophthalmologists and mind you operating under a microscope or those things are really not a problem my only serious consideration yeah, for a uh multifocal or trifocal the current crop of trifocals if the person is seriously interested in night driving because you cannot you can never be sure which patient is going to be bothered by this photopsia but otherwise for me uh, multifocal is the lens of choice and from them uh, you come down in case the patient is not able to afford it or if uh, there are other reasons for not implanting the lens then enhanced monofocal yes thank you this we come to the conclusion of the session and i would request the hoya global team uh, leadership team to please come on stage jimmy paul bern and ishi sir